shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you. So 
moms and their yes for choosing to give us life. So thank you and happy Mother's Day. But I don't want us to forget about the woman today that has not been able to have a child or the woman who may have lost a child or for the woman that her child is estranged from her. This day is not always a joyful day. It's a day that can be a reminder of the title that they have not been able to obtain or a reminder of what they have lost. So today, yes, I want us to celebrate our moms because they and treat them like royalty because they are. They are so deserving. But I also want us to celebrate women in general. For there are many women who live a life worth acknowledging and celebrating that don't necessarily have that title of mom. So to all the women here today and watching online, I want to say happy Mother's Day. Whether today is joyful for you or it brings a sorrowful reminder, I want you to remember God has a plan for your life and in the midst of either your sorrow or your joy, He is there. To all the moms, moms of children who are still at home or all grown up, moms who've outlived a son or daughter, or moms of babies they never got to hold, moms who've raised kids all on their own, or became a mom to someone who needed one. Moms of children who have wandered from God, or the longing to be moms who are still waiting. God perfectly arranged each of you into the role you have today. His word recognizes you as capable, strong, and praiseworthy. Everything you do makes our lives more beautiful. Happy Mother's Day. All right, so this month we have um, our teaching series is a lineage of grace. It has been teaching us about five unlikely women who changed eternity. These women are in the lineage of Jesus, our Savior. Now, you might think that these women, you know, come from a royalty background. However, that is far from um, the truth, okay, from when God picked them to carry out his plan for eternity. Last week, we discussed uh, Tamar and how she tricked Judah by pretending to be a prostitute in order to hopefully get pregnant and carry on his family lineage. As we learned last week, that trick, it worked. And um, if you don't know the full story about Tamar, I want to encourage you to go back and to watch uh, part one of the lineage of grace. Um, and you will pick up that whole story there, and it is a great story to learn from. Now, today, we will learn about the story of Rahab. And I know what you might be thinking. This doesn't sound like a typical Mother's Day message. And... It's probably not, <laughs> okay? <laughs> However, we will discover today how God redefined Rahab the harlot's life and redirects her path to play a part in the lineage of Jesus. Let us pray. Father God, we invite you here today, Jesus, to have your way, Father. Lord God, as your word is going forth, Lord, I ask that it would go, it would be planted into our hearts, Lord Jesus, and it would blossom, Lord. Father, I pray that you, Lord God, today would bring grace over your people, Lord God, and redefine paths that need to be redefined. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Amen. You know, we're going to start in with Rahab, and you can find her in Joshua. Now, this is a time when Moses had passed. The mantle of leading the Israelites into the promised land was now Joshua's business. It was his uh, goal. It was his um, assignment, basically, from God. 
And so he's smart, and then he learned some things from Moses, um, things not to do and some things to do as he is moving the Israelites towards that promised land. And how many of you guys know that we can learn some things from the people before us, right? If you sit down with some older folks and you sit down and listen to their stories, their wisdom, their trials, their things that they have went through, they are a wealth of knowledge. A lot of times we don't sit down with those people until it's, we're older. Right? And we're thinking, man, if I'd have known that 20 years ago, it would have saved me a lot of heartache. Well, we're going to pick up in Joshua chapter 2. A lot of scripture to read, but I think it'll kind of give us the text that we need for this whole story about Rahab. It says, Then Joshua, the son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, Look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent the message to Rahab, Bring out uh, the men who came to you and entered your house, because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hid them. And hidden them. She said, Yes, the men came he came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, the men left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up to them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land, this land to you, and that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea for when you came out of Egypt. Uh, what you did to Shion and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we had heard of this, our hearts melted and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is a God in heaven above and on earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sign, or a sure sign, that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives. The men assured her, if you do not tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us this land. So she let them down by a rope through the window of her house, or for the ha of the house uh, she lived in, for part of it was the city wall. Now she said to them, go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourself there for three days until they return, and then go on your way. The men said to her, This oath you made us uh, made us swear will be binding, uh, will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land you have tied this scarlet cord in your window through which you have let us down, and unless you have brought your father and mother and brothers and all your family into your house. Of all the people that these spies go to, they go to a prostitute's house. But they go there because they need to hide. They can be seen by a lot of people. If they were just walking around the streets, surely they'd be caught. 
surely they would be facing the king of Jericho. But I noticed that Joshua was smart. You know, Moses sent out, what, 12 spies. He sent out 12 spies, and only two came back with a good report. He's like, wait a minute. We had too many opinions about the promised land. We had too many people. We had 10 of them saying, no, we, it's fertile ground. It's a great, it's promised. It, it's beautiful. The grass is green on the other side. But there's giants. And Joshua was like, I learned my lesson. Because remember, Joshua was one of the two spies that came back with a good report. So he only sends two spies out this time. Two. And I find it ironic that she's like negotiating with them. She's negotiating. You know, I'm showing kindness to you. What are you going to do for me? She was kind of in the negotiation business anyways. However, but when we see that, um, that she is, she knows, she knows that God, the God above, has given them the land. She's aware of that. Whether the Holy Spirit was speaking to her, because, you know, he can speak to anybody. The Holy Spirit can speak to anybody. And he had given her insight to what was going on. She said, we know what the Lord is doing. We know that the Lord is giving you this land. And let's pick back up. There's a lot that goes on from chapter 2 to chapter 6, but we're going to pick up in chapter 6. Because now they have, the Israelites have crossed over the Jordan. They are now on the march to Jericho. We see where for six days, they march around one time to go back to camp. Not a really good military strategy, if you think about it. What are we going to do? We're going to go march around the city, and we're going to go back to camp. We're going to do that for six days. But on the seventh day, everybody say the seventh. Seventh day, things change. They get up early in the morning. They go march around, what, seven times. The trumpets are blowing. Here's where we're going to pick up. Chapter 6, verse 20. It says, when the trumpet sounded, the people shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the people gave a loud, loud, uh, loud shout, the wall collapsed. So every man charged straight in, and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it. Men and women, young and old, cattle and sheep and donkeys. Joshua said to the two men, who had spied out the land. Go into the prostitute's house and bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance to your oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother, brother, and all who belonged to her. And they, and they brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. Uh, when they burned down the whole city and everything in it, but had put the silver and gold and artifacts and bronze and iron in the treasury of the Lord's house, but Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her, because she hid the men Joshua had sent to spot as the spies of Jericho, and she lives among the Israelites to this day. That negotiation that she had with the spies before she let them down the rope out of her window saved her life. Smart move on her part. Yeah, absolutely. So what can we learn from Rahab that every woman, mother, and man needs to hear? Well, there are three points that we believe will help each one of us. So point number one, God saves those with a past. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. God saves those with a past. From scripture, we know that Rahab was a harlot. Okay, Her house or establishment was positioned by the city gate of Jericho. It was hard to miss. The house was nestled against the town wall at the gate. 
As you can imagine, Rahab was servicing many traveling men passing through. Okay, uh, not always in the best smelling condition. Okay, so if you really think about that, it's like, wow. Okay, um, so according to um, rabbinical uh, tradition, Rahab was one of the um, four most beautiful women in the ancient world. Okay, so business for her was undoubtedly brisk. Um, I think we can conclude right here and agree that Rahab had a past. Okay, Rahab, she had a past. Rahab was only, only bad for a season, but not forever. When those two spies showed up at her house that night, the wind of change was blowing across her doorstep at that very moment. She didn't know what was about to happen and take place in her life, but oh, God did, okay? Rahab was living in sin, but guess what? God knew that. God knew right where Rahab was at and what she was doing. Rahab the harlot was not hiding anything from God. And you know, the fact is, we can't hide anything from God either. Uh, we can't hide sin from God. You can maybe hide uh, sin for a season from your spouse or your friends or uh, family, but you are not hiding from God. God sees you in your sin. He sees you in your sin, and guess what? He still loves you. He still loves you. Amen is right. This doesn't give us a free pass now to keep sinning. Uh, yes, will God still love you in your sin? Absolutely. However, he loves you so much that he has a better way for you. He has a better life for you when you acknowledge him and surrender your sin to him. Yeah, he wants you to have correction in your life. That's right. Yeah. Yes. So let's look at Romans 3, 22, 24. I'm reading this out of the Amplified Bible. It says, this righteousness of God comes through faith in Jesus Christ for all those, Jew or Gentile, who believe and trust in him and acknowledge him as God's son. There is no distinction since all have sinned. I want to say that again. Since all have sinned and continually fall short of the glory of God and are being justified, declared free of the guilt of sin, made acceptable to God, and granted eternal life as a gift by his precious, undeserved grace through the redemption, the payment for our sin, which is provided in Christ Jesus. We all have sin, okay? And we continually to fall short every day. We continually to fall short. That's the reason why we need God's grace. We don't have the right to cast a stone or to look sideways at Ray, Rahab. Um, because like her, we too need God's grace and redemption provided through Jesus Christ. So if you have breath in your lungs, then you have a past. Okay? The good news is, everyone here today, you have breath in your lungs because you are here today. Okay? So everyone You're watching has online. Past. You've got breath in your lungs right now. Yes, amen. And so we all have a past. Um, we have different, we all have, you know, maybe different types of sins that were committed. But the one thing that we all can know and realize and agree today is that Jesus Christ came and died to save us no matter what our past may look like. No matter what you have ever done, Jesus Christ came to save you. So once you get saved, this is just great news. Okay, you ready for it? Once you get saved, you are not defined by your past. God does not look at you based off of what you used to do or who you used to be. Okay, that is good news. I need to get an amen up in here because amen. you are not defined by your past. Yeah, so many times we... We live in that past, right? Yes. We can't get past it. We're, we're struggling with it. We're like, well, and the enemy will whisper to you, 
He'll whisper to you. Point number two, and that leads us to our point number two, is God uses those with a past. Now, most people can agree that God can save us, right? He can save anyone. God, if we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior in our hearts, we're saved. Salvation. That's what Jesus died on the cross for. However, to use someone with a checkered past, hmm, might be some different opinions right there. Because a lot of times, that's a tough one to swallow. Well, you don't know what they did. You don't know how they treated me. You don't know what they've been involved in. And God doesn't look at that. He wants us out of our sin. He wants us to reconcile with him. He wants us, especially, you ever, you ever ask people about someone and right away they're giving your opinion, well, you know, they did this or they did that. You know, especially those stuffy religious people that walk around like they're smelling something bad all the time. They got their nose stuck up. Right? You ever know them people? Right? And I'm not just talking about religious people. I'm just talking about people in general that just think that they're better than everybody else. They look down upon someone that maybe has a checkered past. You know? But let's just be honest. Um, there's this little thing, maybe a big thing sometimes, called judgment. And people lash out because of others' past. Others that have maybe even hurt you. But we hear excuses all the time like, well, their sin is too great. I mean, they're, they try to be good, but, you know, they just can't do it. They weren't raised right. You know, the mama didn't teach them right. You hear all kinds of excuses, right? Or they've just waited too long in their life to get their life straightened out. I've heard that before. They've just waited too long. They waited until they were 50 or 60 years old. Well, that's just too late. Look at all the time they wasted. However, God doesn't look at that. God doesn't look at that at all. Newsflash, everyone in the Bible had issues. Abraham, the father of faith, had issues. I mean, if we're looking at... At what God used, the people that he used, God used the least likely to succeed in the class yearbook to do mighty things to change the trajectory of history. I mean, Moses killed an Egyptian and ran off to go hide, yet he had a burning bush experience. And even in the middle of his mess, God knew where to find him. He knew where to find them, and he led them back to Egypt to lead the Israelites. From tending the flocks to tending the people, and from leading the sheep to leading God's people. He used Moses despite all his problems. We see this with the disciple Peter, right? He was a little rough around the edges, didn't have a filter on his mouth. More than once, Jesus had to correct him. Right? Had to correct them. I mean, but he denied Jesus three times. Yet, Jesus still reinstated him after the resurrection. He wanted to use him. He reminded Peter. He said, what did I tell you? What did I tell you? It reminds us, Matthew 18, uh, 16, 18. It says, I tell you that you, Peter, which means rock, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. He's reminding him that you're valuable. God will remind you that you're valuable. Don't let the devil tell you otherwise. Don't let the devil tell you that just because you made a mistake, that you're disqualified. So many times we walk around with that defeat. And God is saying in his word, stop it. You're my child. It's like my past. If you would ask someone 20, 30 years ago, would I be walking with the Lord? 
kid that laughed at you. There ain't no way. No way. They're like, you won't even go to church. But this Thursday marks an anniversary for me. This Thursday, March 11th. For 16 years, I have not had a drop of alcohol. I had an experience. I had one of those burning bush experiences with God. In my living room, laying on the couch, and God says, get up and dump out all the alcohol. And I dumped it out on the sink, put it in black trash bags, and I've never looked back since. God can take what is holding you captive, what is what has bound you for years, and he can change. He can change your heart, and he can use you. Did I ever think that I'd be sitting in church or let alone pastor a church? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Listen, God can do amazing things, just like he did with Rahab. Despite her past, God used Rahab. It was the first battle of the Promised Land. They crossed over the Jordan. They were at the city of Jericho. This was going to be the first battle. And here... Who did they get help from? But a prostitute. Someone that everyone else and probably in the city had discounted for doing anything good. And she played a huge part in it. Not only did she save the spies that Joshua had sent out, but she also saved herself and saved her family. I mean, there was a lot at stake. Remember, she negotiated with them. She said, wait, wait a minute, I'm being kind to you, Dean. What are you going to do for me? Well, let's be honest. Most of the time, her actions were not something to be proud of. They weren't going to be brought up at the family reunion. You know, little Billy here, he made the honor roll. You know, Julie is now going to law school. Jimmy's starting a, a business. And Kathy, oh, she just became a biologist. And, well, Rahab, uh... She's in the hospitality trade. I mean, what else are you going to say about her? Right? They definitely weren't bragging on her. However, her move, her obedience, her willingness in realizing that even though she wasn't really serving God, that there was a God in heaven that was doing a move in the Israelites. And she recognized that. She recognized that these men came from the Israelites and that God had sent them to her. She realized that she was playing an important role. And in that, in that, it was a huge difference. But at the next gathering, oh, what a story they were going to tell. Oh, man, they were going to be like, hey, let me tell you a story about our daughter." about some spies, about the rope and scarlet cord, about marching around the wall and trumpets blaring and walls falling down, and Rahab saved us all. Come on, what kind of story at the family reunion was that going to be? A celebration, right? Because of, yeah, a comeback, a change of heart, too. A change of heart. I mean, she was the least likely that they probably were going to ever brag on. And here they are, excited. But I have a, a question for you. Basically, it's an internal question. You've got to answer it honestly to yourself. What whispers are you listening to that is keeping you from letting God use you in a mighty way? What is the enemy bringing up time and time again about your past? He might do it with your finances. He might do it with just how you're raising kids. He might do it with relationships. But what is the enemy whispering to you that you have just struggled with? Sometimes you think you've defeated it, but then it comes back up. And we let it come back up sometimes. We let it. Maybe this is an issue you've had for 10 years. Maybe it's just over the last year. Maybe it's been a week. 
or last night. He's whispering in your ear to make you think that you're disqualified. The devil loves to do that. He loves to make you think that your past is going to haunt you the rest of your life. And that is a lie from the pit of hell. Jesus came and died for that. He is not going to allow you to keep reliving that and reliving that. The bondage is broken. The chains are broken. Don't give the enemy ground that Jesus has already taken on the cross. There was hope for Rahab, and there is hope for you and I as well. The things that we have struggled with for years are defeated. That is only the blood. So point three, okay? God gives grace and redefines those given paths. Okay? God gives grace and redefines those given paths. So I believe we all can relate to Rahab when it comes to needing the grace of God. So now we are here in our message today to discuss how God gave grace and redefined Rahab's path. So let's take a look at, um, we're going to look back at Joshua 6, 25. So Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her father's household and everything that she had. And she had lived among Israel to this day because she hid the messengers, scouts, whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. So when Rahab walked out of the house that day, it was for the last time, and out of Jericho forever. She left everything behind. She left her old ways of doing things. Okay, So she left Rahab the harlot behind. It was her path. She became part of the Israelite community and lived among them. A man named Salmon took her as wife. Now, we don't know for sure, um, but was Salmon perhaps one of the two unnamed spies who saw her embrace his God with passion and in return that caused him to embrace her as his wife? Question to ask ourselves. But from the ashes of Jericho, Romance bloomed. Matthew 1, 5 through 6 said, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. Rahab gave birth to Boaz. Okay, how amazing is that? The lineage of Jesus, that he took Rahab the harlot and, and placed her in the lineage of Jesus to give birth to Boaz, which eventually we know. Yep. Yeah. yeah, God used Rahab to shape the character and faith and the godliness in his son named Boaz. Mm -hmm. We read Boaz, and he's a model child. I mean, he's a... He's a uh, a man of great character, a great a man, uh, a rich man. He is a man that has a heart and compassion for God and people, and it all came from Rahab. Yeah. I mean, it probably was a struggle. I'm not saying that she got uh, to the camp of the Israelites and everything just fell in place for her, and she was like, "Oh, okay, everything's good." My past is past. She probably struggled. She probably struggled like you and I do, probably to the point where she was like maybe even second-guessing herself. Is this really me? It's, I'm not used to this. I'm not used to acting like this. But with God, it isn't who you were that matters. It's who you are becoming that matters. Okay, so Rahab's courageous act earned her a spot in the Hebrew honor roll. So we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31. It says, By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Now you might ask yourself, why is you know Rahab so-called a uh, prostitute Rahab in that scripture if God changed her path? Well, Rahab's Past was mentioned for the same reason we hear people share their testimonies today. 
to demonstrate the transformation that the before and after power of knowing the Lord. Stories of how God has changed lives are intended to glorify sin. They are meant to glorify God's grace. I'm going to say that again. So your story, your testimony that you share of what God has helped you overcome, okay, is not intended to glorify the sin that you once lived in. It's to glorify God's grace and what he did when he sent Jesus to the cross to die for you. Okay, so it's all to glorify God's grace. If God can turn heart, a harlot into a holy vessel, entrusting her with the very genes that would one day produce the king of kings, then surely those of us with a past can leave our shame in the rubble and walk away fixing our eyes on the one who washes us white as snow. Let's look at Isaiah 1.18. It says, come now, let us settle this matter, says the Lord. Through your sins, or though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Today, I want to encourage you to turn to Jesus and experience the wonders he has waiting for you. Yeah, he can take your past, no matter what it is. No matter what it is. She was discounted as being nothing but a prostitute. But, I mean, no one would have ever seen her becoming part of the lineage of Jesus, of the Messiah. No way. And God says, you know what? I've got something in store for each and every one of you. You just got to have the faith. It says, by faith, she had it. You gotta believe it. You gotta tell yourself every day, I am valuable in God's eyes. And I think too, this story of Rahab, it should just give us all hope here today. To know that if God took a harlot and he used her, then what can he do with us, each and every one of us in our lives? It should give us a hope to know that God cares about us. Yeah, that you're not gonna be disqualified by something you've done in your past. Again, like you said, it doesn't give you, you know, a free pass to continue to sin. But what it does say is there is hope for you. There is hope that God can change your heart, change your mindset. That's a huge thing. There's, you know, there's about 11 or 12 inches from your heart to your head. And guess what? In that, there's a lot of emotions that get mixed up sometimes. There's a lot of things that the devil between uh, what he's whispering in your ear is going to your head and your heart. We got to make sure that we're in line. That's why it's important to read God's word, to be in His word. Let Him speak to you, encourage you. You need to be around people that are going to encourage you the right way. And guess what? You're going to lose some friends. When you change a, a lifestyle, you're going to have times where you're going to lose some friends. When I stopped drinking, guess what? My drinking buddies weren't hanging around me. I wasn't hanging around them. I went off on a different path. And it's okay. It's okay to be okay with it. And I'm sure Rahab, same thing. I mean, she was probably thinking, well, I've always done this. I, I've always been in this sinful lifestyle. And God says, there's a better way. There is a better way. You can get out of it. You can get out of anything. We just have to be strong in the Lord and believe that he's going to work through us. Let us stand. And maybe you're watching today online or maybe you're here today. And you say, you know what? I need that saving grace of Jesus in my life. All we have to do is just open up our hearts and our minds to receive them. So if everyone would, close your eyes, bow your head. And say this very simple prayer. Say, Heavenly Father, I believe that your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross for my sin. But on the third day, he rose from that grave.
is alive today. And Lord, I ask you into my heart. I ask you into my life. Lord, I will live all the days of my life for you. In Christ's name I pray. And everyone say, Amen and Amen. Now I'm going to tell you right now, the devil will whisper lies to you. The devil will continually remind you of your past. He loves instant replay. If you ever watch sports and you see a, a play and they go back and they review it because they want to see what it was, a bad call, whatever it was, the devil is instant re He loves instant replay. He will play your mistakes back in your head time and time again. And that's where we got to tell the devil no, I am better than that. I am better than I used to be. And you might have to get ugly with him. You might have to wrestle with him. You're going to have to repeat it to him numerous times, but it's okay. Because you got to know where you stand in the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father God, as we go out into this week, Lord, Lord, let us have that faith that Rahab had. Might not have all the answers right away, but Lord, use us in a mighty way. Lord, help us to overcome our past. Help us to leave it behind, to drop it, and walk away from it. Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for this message. We thank you, Lord, that we can learn that you can use us in a mighty way for your kingdom. Lord, we thank you for your mercy, grace, and protection over us as we leave today. And in Christ's name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen, amen and Amen.